What a better way to describe our reason here today. We are in need. We are in need of him. Let's, let's pray to him. Father God, Father God, we praise and we honor you because we need you. Everything that is good comes from you, Father, and we know that. We praise and you, we honor you for that, Lord. And we come together today, thank you for this chance to be together. So many faces that I'm seeing this morning that I haven't seen in a while. And Father, thank you for that. Thank you for that togetherness that we can come together to praise you. Thank you, Lord. We need you. Help us to be more aware of your presence, Lord. Help us to be more aware of your presence. When we're here, we know you're here. When, when, when we're tempted by sin, Father, we know you're there. Help us to be aware that you're with us always. Help us to, to see you working in our lives every day, Lord. This is our prayer, Father. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks. Well, welcome. Why don't we stand and sing? We'll start with the highest place. Good to see so many... So many faces back. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of lords. You are the mighty God. You are the king of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of lords, you are the mighty God, you are the king of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave, you are the song that I sing. In moments like these I sing out a song, I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these I lift up my voice, I lift up my voice to the Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. I love you. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus in moments like these. I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord. And the singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I love you, Lord. Singing, I. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Lord God, we come before your majestic throne, thanking you for all of your wonderful blessings. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather here today collectively to give you praise, to give you glory, and to give you honor. Father, we, you are our refuge. We come to you, Father, in these times of need. We pray, Father, that you continue just to watch over us and protect us. Father, if we've done anything that against your throne, either in thought or word or deed, we ask that you forgive us, even as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. 
Father, we thank you for allowing us to sing praises to you and to tell the world that you are our God and it is you and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whom we trust. Father, we pray, as it says in the book of Timothy, we pray for those in high places. Father, we pray that you be with our president. Bless him to make choices that we can live a peaceable life. Father, we pray that you be with our governor as well. And the policies that are enacted will allow us to continue to praise you and worship you openly, that the world might know that we are your children. Father, we pray that you be with each and every family that is here today. We pray that you fill all of us with your Holy Spirit, that we might be a little bit more like you after we leave here than we were before we came. Father, we pray that you bless our minister, Brother Todd. Bless him to remember those things that he has studied. Bless him to impart your word upon us that it will make us stronger and better and wiser Christians. Father, we thank you for the elders of this great church. We pray that you also continue to guide them and direct them as they put forth the programs and and guide and direct and watch over the souls of the flock here. And Father, we just simply pray that we can be an example of who you are. As you said in the book of John, and Jesus said that he, the Father is in him, and he is in the Father, and he is in us. So in, in him being in us, may we show forth that example of who he is in our daily living. Father, be with us through the remainder of this worship service today. May our praises and our glory and our songs to you be well accepted and you might be well pleased in all that we do. And it's in your son, Jesus Christ, sweet, precious, and holy name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. Worthy is the Lamb. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace thank you for this love Lord thank you for the nail pierced hands wash me in your cleansing flow now all I know your forgiveness and embrace worthy is the last Crown you now with many 
many crowns, you reign victorious, high and lifted up, Jesus, Son of God, the darling of heaven, crucified, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. Good morning, everyone. As we gather around this table to celebrate the sacrifice that our Lord God gave to us. Let us not be limited to these, these five minutes or this hour today. Let us continue during our week, at our jobs, at our schools, to continue to celebrate the love that the Lord has shown for us. Before uh, we pray for the bread and the juice, I'd like to do a reading from Mark, chapter 14, verses 20 through, 22 through 25. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Let us pray for the bread. Father God, thank you for this day. And thank you for your son. We are so grateful for this day you have given us to celebrate you and your love with this church family. We remember the ultimate sacrifice you gave to us and for us by taking this bread. But Father, let us remember and celebrate the sacrifice not just today, but tomorrow at our jobs and our homes and all the times that we continue this walk with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the juice. Dear Father God, we come to you again so grateful for the sacrifice and the blood that was shed for us and for our sins. Continue to be with us, all of us, this church family and your church families across this world as we continue to grow from the love that you have shown us and will continue to show us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Ancient words.
Turn, if you will, to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I want to begin by reading the last paragraph of this chapter, verses 38 through 42. Now, as they were traveling along, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, for Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Let's pray. Lord, we do need you this morning. I need you this morning. Lord, you know that I have no clue what I'm doing. I don't know how to effectively communicate the message that you've put in my spirit. So I'm asking you to come this morning and do what only you can do. Amen. Martha and Mary are a, an interesting study. Uh, this, of course, is not the only place in the Gospels where those two ladies are found. And often people will point to these sisters as illustrations of the fact that people have different personalities. And, of course, they do show that very thing. Martha seems to have been more of a doer, someone who is comfortable uh, with busyness, whereas Mary was more relational. Uh, the book that we used years ago when we were studying spiritual gifts, I think, used the phrases uh, task-oriented and people-oriented uh, to kind of sum up the two basic categories of personalities that you have. And, and we are very different. And one personality type is not any better or any worse than the other. We're just different. That's the way God made us to be. Some people are more people-oriented, others are more task-oriented, and that is as it should be. That, of course, is not what Jesus is getting at in this story. It has very little to do with the lesson that Jesus is trying to impress on us here. What Jesus is saying is that whatever your personality type happens to be, when it comes to the kingdom of God, we must get our priorities right. And in the kingdom of God, doing things for Jesus is not as important as spending time with Jesus. That is the message that Jesus is giving us here in this passage. Now, doing things for Jesus is important. And I'm sure that the activities that Martha was engaged in as she was trying to show hospitality to Jesus... That was important. It was good work. The problem was she was allowing a good and important thing to distract her from the most important thing, which was sitting at Jesus' feet. And sitting at Jesus' feet is just a picture. For us, it is a picture of communing with Christ. How do we do that? We do that when we sit down with the scriptures and read and meditate and pray and enjoy fellowship with our Lord. We don't see him with our physical eyes like Mary did, but we can, just as surely as she did, sit at the feet of Rabbi Jesus and feast on his word and commune with him. And Jesus is saying that there is nothing more important than that. It is the one thing that is necessary. 
When we don't do that, then all kinds of bad things happen. For one thing, we become spiritually weak. We become spiritually anemic because spending time with Jesus is where we get our life. Our, our very life comes from him. And we neglect that relationship to our own detriment. But it also results in ineffective service. We want to do things for the Lord, but when we simply engage in the busyness of ministry without first engaging in time alone with him and fostering that relationship, then the ministry becomes fruitless because we end up serving the Lord in our own strength because it's in our time in fellowship with him that we tap into his power. And if I try to serve the Lord without being with the Lord, then my service ends up being fruitless. It is a testimony to the effectiveness and the brilliance of our enemy that he is still able in the 21st century to convince countless Christians to fall into the same mistake that Martha made in Luke 10. She was doing good works, but she was so busy doing good works that she neglected the most important thing. Today, there are thousands, probably millions of Christians who are doing the very same thing. They want to serve God. They, they have good hearts. They, they really want to do good things for the Lord. And so they engage in all kinds of busyness, all kinds of good activities. And there is nothing wrong with that. In fact, if you're going to live a life uh, following Jesus, then there are things that you will do. You will show love to your neighbor in practical ways. We will do good works. But so many Christians become so engrossed in doing things for the Lord that they neglect spending time with the Lord, the one thing that is most important. Some of you have heard this before. I'm, I'm pretty sure I read this a couple of years ago in a Wednesday night class. Uh, but this is from a book on spiritual transformation by John Ortberg. And he is uh, describing here a friend of a friend of his. He's, this is actually told in the words of his friend Tom Schmidt. And this, this is a few pages, but uh, bear with me. I think you'll find this interesting. The state-run convalescent hospital is not a pleasant place. It is large, understaffed, and overfilled with senile and helpless and lonely people who are waiting to die. On the brightest of days, it seems dark inside, and it smells of sickness and stale urine. I went there once or twice a week for four years, but I never wanted to go there, and I always left with a sense of relief. It is not the kind of place one gets used to. On this particular day, I was walking in a hallway that I had not visited before, looking in vain for a few who were alive enough to receive a flower and a few words of encouragement. This hallway seemed to contain some of the worst cases, strapped onto carts or into wheelchairs and looking completely helpless. As I neared the end of this hallway, I saw an old woman strapped up in a wheelchair. Her face was an absolute horror. The empty stare and white pupils of her eyes told me that she was blind. The large hearing aid over one ear told me that she was almost deaf. One side of her face was being eaten by cancer. There was a discolored and running sore covering part of one cheek, and it had pushed her nose to one side, dropped one eye, and distorted her jaw so that what should have been the corner of her mouth was the bottom of her mouth. As a consequence, she drooled constantly. I was told later that when new nurses arrived, the supervisors would send them to feed this woman, thinking that if they could stand this sight, they could stand anything in the building. I also learned later that this woman was 89 years old and that she had been here, bedridden, blind, 
nearly deaf and alone for 25 years. This was Mabel. I don't know why I spoke to her. She looked less likely to respond than most of the people I saw in that hallway. But I put a flower in her hand and said, here is a flower for you. Happy Mother's Day. She held the flower up to her face and tried to smell it. And then she spoke. And much to my surprise, her words, although somewhat garbled because of her deformity, were obviously produced by a clear mind. She said, thank you. It's lovely. But can I give it to someone else? I can't see it, you know. I'm blind. I said, of course. And I pushed her in her chair back down the hallway to a place where I thought I could find some alert patients. I found one, and I stopped the chair. Mabel held out the flower and said, here, this is from Jesus. That was when it began to dawn on me that this was not an ordinary human being. Later, I wheeled her back to her room and learned more about her history. She had grown up on a small farm that she managed with only her mother until her mother died. Then she ran the farm alone until 1950 when her blindness and sickness sent her to the convalescent hospital. For 25 years, she got weaker and sicker with constant headaches, back aches, and stomach aches, and then the cancer came too. Her three roommates were all human vegetables who screamed occasionally but never talked. They often soiled their bedclothes, and because the hospital was understaffed, especially on Sundays when I usually visited, the stench was often overpowering. Mabel and I became friends over the next few weeks, and I went to see her once or twice a week for the next three years. Her first words to me were usually an offer of hard candy from a tissue box near her bed. Some days I would read to her from the Bible, and often, when I would pause, she would continue reciting the passage from memory, word for word. On other days, I would take a book of hymns and sing with her, and she would know all of the words of the old songs. For Mabel, these were not merely exercises in memory. She would often stop in mid-hymn and make a brief comment about lyrics she considered particularly relevant to her own situation. I never heard her speak of loneliness or pain except in the stress she placed on certain lines in certain hymns. It was not many weeks before I turned from a sense that I was being helpful to a sense of wonder, and I would go to her with a pen and paper to write down the things she would say. During one hectic week on a final exams, I was frustrated because my mind seemed to be pulled in ten directions at once with all the things that I had to think about. The question occurred to me, what does Mabel have to think about? Hour after hour, day after day, week after week, not even able to know if it's day or night, so I went to her and asked, Mabel, what do you think about when you lie here? And she said, I think about my Jesus. I sat there and thought for a moment about the difficulty for me of thinking about Jesus for even five minutes. And I asked, what do you think about Jesus? She replied slowly and deliberately as I wrote, I think about how good he's been to me. He's been awfully good to me in my life, you know. I'm one of those kind who's, almost, uh, or who's mostly satisfied. Lots of folks wouldn't care much for what I think. Lots of folks would think I'm kind of old-fashioned, but I don't care. I'd rather have Jesus. He's all the world to me. And then Mabel began to sing an old hymn. Jesus is all the world to me. My life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without him, I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. This is not fiction. Incredible as it may seem, a human being really lived like this. I know because I knew her. The kind of life that Mabel lived, the kind of person that she had become, I don't believe is supposed to be an exception. I believe that Jesus intends for all of his disciples to live that way. I believe he's made it possible, and I believe 
It is supposed to be the normal life for a mature follower of Christ. To arrive at the point where we can honestly say, not, not just sing the words, but to honestly mean them from the heart. Jesus is everything to me. He is all the world. He's not just one thing among many that I have to give attention to. He's not one thing among many that I'm devoted to, but he is all the world to me. It's possible to live that way. This morning in my uh, devotional reading, uh, one of the books that I look at is uh, Tozer on the Holy Spirit. And in this morning's reading, Tozer was talking about how in heaven, there is absolutely no disharmony between the angels and God. Uh, the angels desire the will of God. There's never any conflict between what God wants and what the angels want because there is no sin in heaven. Our situation is completely different. We live in a fallen world and we live with sinful natures and so there is constant conflict between what we want and what God wants. There's this constant internal battle that Paul describes in Galatians 5 between the flesh and the spirit. And God's goal for us as followers of Jesus is more than simply to have us do different things. His goal is not simply for us to become moral people. His goal is more than for me to, to learn to act in a righteous or godly way. Ultimately, he's trying to change my desires. He's trying to change me into a different kind of person, not just a person who behaves differently. The goal is for my will to come into alignment with God's will and for me not simply to do the right things but to do the things God wants me to do because I want to do them. Because I have become a different person. I have been transformed from the inside out by the power of the Holy Spirit so that my affections are now on the things that God loves. That is the desire of God. That is the goal of following Jesus. And that is no small task. Given the fallenness of our nature, the strength of the flesh that we constantly battle, it is a huge undertaking, and it's not something we accomplish ourselves. It is the work of the Holy Spirit, thank God, because we can't do it. The Holy Spirit has to get a hold of us and change us and redirect our love and teach us to love Him rather than to love the things of the world. He teaches us little by little to remove our affections from the kingdom of the world and place them over here in the kingdom of God. How does that happen? When I was a kid, um, one thing we would sometimes do was watch the Dallas Cowboys play Football. My dad was a big football fan. He played football when he was in high school. And we were from Fort Worth, right next door to Dallas. And so the Cowboys were our natural uh, favorite. And I don't keep up with football anymore, so I don't know how they're doing now. But back then, they were pretty good. And they, had, they had a brilliant head coach. Back in those days, uh, the coach was Tom Landry. Tom Landry said one time that... A football coach's job is to make men do what they don't want to do 
so that they become what they've always wanted. God is trying to make us into what we want to become. If we're followers of Jesus, then we want to become a kind, the kind of people who are so enamored with Jesus that he is our treasure. He means more to us than anything else. And we, we just naturally um, find our greatest joy and our greatest satisfaction in him. And like Mabel, because he means all the world to us, circumstances become irrelevant. It doesn't really matter what happens to me because my relationship with Christ is such that he is my treasure and if I've got him, that is all that matters. Now, that's what we want to become. In order to get there, we will have to do things we don't want to do. I mentioned last week, 1 Timothy 4, verse 7, where Paul says, Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself. Train yourself for the purpose of godliness. If you were going to learn how to play the piano, you would, you would know there was going to be a certain amount of sacrifice and commitment involved, right? Right? You would have to commit yourself to devoting a certain number of hours every week to uh, learning the scales and everything else that's involved. I don't know how to play the piano, so I don't know all that's involved in that. But I know it takes time, and I know it takes a serious commitment. It takes discipline to learn a skill like that if you want to learn to play it well. If you wanted to learn how to speak a foreign language, you would have to use discipline. You would have to go through a process, devote time every day to learning the basics, the, the vocabulary, uh, the pronunciation of the words, the rules of grammar, and all of that would have to be slowly and gradually learned through discipline. Probably things you don't really enjoy, things that you don't necessarily want to do, but you want to be able to speak this language. And so you discipline yourself, you train yourself in order to reach that goal. Learning to follow Jesus is at least as hard as learning to play the piano. Learning to follow Jesus is at least as hard as learning a new language. So why would we think that we can do that without a major time commitment, without a, a serious, disciplined regimen by which we're going to gradually study the basics and, and learn all the things that are involved so that we can reach the goal and become this new kind of person. Again, it's the Holy Spirit that does the work it's not a matter of just trying harder, and that's why the most important thing I can do as a follower of Jesus is spend time at the feet of Rabbi Jesus because that is where transformation happens. That is where the Holy Spirit comes in and reshapes my heart and redirects my affections. But it takes time. And you're probably not going to start out um, enjoying the process. That's why scripture talks about discipline. Paul even uh, more than once compared living the Christian life to an athletic contest. And he said, you've got to train yourself for this. You've got to discipline your body. This is not an easy thing. I don't claim to, uh, to be an ex expert on this by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, I am not where I want to be. But I, 
I have seen progress in my life. I have experienced some growth in this area, and I am seeing more and more what it is like to be absolutely consumed with Jesus. To, to want Jesus more than I want the things of this world. And I started on this journey. I got started late in life. But when I started on this journey, it came through discipline. And it came by prioritizing what Jesus says must be the main thing. And that is spending time with him. I started committing myself to spending one hour a day in communion with Christ. And it wasn't because I woke up one morning and had this deep longing to pray or read the Bible. That wasn't it at all. The Lord had convicted me. He had brought me to a place where I, I realized I need to make a change. I was 41 years old. I had been a preacher for over a decade, and I still was not prioritizing my time alone with God. I was doing a lot of things for God, but I was not communing with God. And so I just, as a matter of discipline, made the decision, I'm going to commit myself to this, and I did. I started out with a six-month commitment. And by the end of that six months, I had so learned to enjoy that daily hour with the Lord that there was no way I was ever going back to normal life. It had changed me completely. It didn't start out as a joyful thing. I didn't start out with a hunger for God. And, and I still am not as hungry for God as I want to be. And even though I now have learned to enjoy that time alone with the Lord, and even though I now know that's the most important thing, I still neglect it sometimes. I still get distracted. I still have days where I get busy with other things and I don't get around to it. But my life is totally different from the way it was before that change. And here's what I want to suggest to you. And again, I've talked too long this morning, but as a practical application for this week, ask yourself, look at, look at how you spend your days, your hours throughout the week, and ask yourself, does my daily routine reflect the fact that Jesus said spending time with him is the one thing that is absolutely critical, the one thing that is most important. And if you need to make a change, then do that this week. And do it just as a matter of discipline. Don't wait for the desire. The desire comes through practice. As I've said before, uh, hunger in the spiritual realm works exactly opposite of hunger in the physical realm. If you want to get hungry physically, then don't eat. If you want to get spiritually hungry, then fill yourself with the word of God. The more you eat, the more you feast on God, the hungrier you become. And so start, just begin. I've got a, a quotation uh, printed out and framed on my desk in my office down the hall. Uh, by John Wesley. I don't have it memorized. It's kind of lengthy, but, uh, but that's the essence of it. Just, just start. Just begin. Start devoting some time every day and, and make it more than you're comfortable with, but make it something you can handle, something that you'll actually stick with. But some time every day for prayer and the reading of the Word of God, and not just reading, but reading with meditation. And begin, because it is your life. Your, your spiritual life is what's at stake here. Your fruitfulness in ministry. If you want to accomplish anything good 
in the service of God, you've got to start there. It's got to flow out of this deep intimacy that exists between you and the Lord. Otherwise, you're just acting, uh, uh, ministering out of your own strength. And so begin just as a matter of discipline and commit to it. And if you don't schedule it, if you don't write it down in your appointment book or on your calendar, it's probably not going to get done. If you just uh, have a good intention and say, well, I'm, I'm going to try to do that, maybe at the end of the day before I go to bed, you'll get busy with other things and it won't happen. You've got to prioritize it. You've got to put it on the schedule and you've got to commit to it. And there will be days when you miss. Don't let that discourage you. Just go right back to it and say, remind yourself, read Luke 10. This is what Jesus says is the most important thing, the one thing that is absolutely essential to my life as a follower of Jesus. This is something I cannot ignore. And uh, see what the Lord does with it. All right, uh, for those of you who are uh, new or visiting, haven't been here in a while, uh, we are, uh, after the lesson, uh, engaging in some group discussion, and so anyone is free to uh, comment or ask questions. Do you have any observations this morning about Martha or Mary or Mabel? Anybody? Okay, James. So really, uh, I'll say I'll start off. Uh, this was a great lesson. Uh, I needed this today well, uh, because me and my wife had started uh, a little while ago, uh, about a year or so ago. Uh, every morning, getting into the Bible, reading a chapter or so of the New mm -hmm. Testament. And I fell off the wagon, so this is a, a good knock in the head with, uh, with that. But, uh, yeah. well, good. she wants me to let y'all know that she is still on the wagon. I'm the one that's fell off. So. Okay. She wakes me up, and then I stay in bed. So. But anyway, uh, the other part that I was going to talk about was uh, in reading this, uh, there's um, uh, very good lessons in this chapter. Uh, that I think uh, is essential for us today. Uh, yeah. One being uh, the story of uh, Mary and Martha, but if you look at the parable right before that, uh, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan uh, yes. that is told in here. And in our world, especially here in the United States uh, right now, I think that is the one that we absolutely need. Uh, today, in today's society, it's not cool to be Christian, and it's not cool to... Uh, talk about Christian teachings, but we have forgot as a, as a society how to treat others. And we look at someone that is different than us, and we treat them with disdain or, or disregard. And Jesus' teaching, uh, specifically that one, uh, teaches us completely different. He says, go out and uh, seek those people that are different from you and embrace them and bring them into uh, the following of Christ, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, just absolutely enjoy reading that. And I think that's something yeah. that we need to hear uh, today because, again, too many of us are uh, divided in whatever aspect that we're divided in, and we go to our yeah. corners and, you know, we come out fighting instead of coming out loving and mm -hmm. uh, being with, the, with yes. one another. Yes, good point. And uh, yeah, like you say, there, there is uh, so much there that uh, deserves study and reflection and uh, so many great lessons. And uh, yeah, like I said before, we could spend years just going through the Gospel of Luke if we took, it, it took every verse, every paragraph. Uh, yeah, great material there, wonderful parable. Somebody else? Okay. That was an excellent lesson this morning, and just to, I know y'all think I'm going to talk about the mass, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but it, but it was a, a excellent lesson. And as I was uh, looking through that and, and, and reflecting on what you were saying, I actually put this down as, as spending time with the Lord is what, is what will help us understand our assignment from the Lord. Because uh, Martha was anxious. Jesus said she was anxious and, and troubled by many things. And, of course, the Bible tells us not to be anxious. And she made this, and, and just reading it, she made the assumption, well, the Lord is hungry. I'm going to go get this food. I'm gonna do, but, but it's not us that gives God our assignment. He gives us our assignment. And so, what, so, that's what, so that's what I, and that's what I've understood in my own life. The more I've spent time with him, the more I understand what my assignment is because he gives us our assignment. And I just want to ask you, have you found that to be true as well as you spent yes. your time with him? Absolutely. Uh, yes, that was one of the, the biggest changes that, that I experienced when I started prioritizing my time with God um, was I, I started hearing from the Lord. And, and we've talked about that before. He speaks in all kinds of different ways. I'm not talking about an audible voice. But he begins to uh, put things on your heart um, that you know aren't from you. Uh, he, he has ways of communicating. But we have to put ourselves in a position where he has our undivided attention. And where we are focused on him and we give him the opportunity to speak. Uh, he, he can speak whether we let him or not. But the issue is, am I hearing it? And when I started spending uh, more focused time in prayer, I started discerning the Lord's voice, the Lord's will for me uh, in a, at a whole new level. And it, that was extraordinary. That, that was one of the things that just blew my mind after just a, a, within a couple of months. Uh, he was, uh, he was, it, it was, it's hard to put into words. It, uh, my Christianity became, uh, fr it went from uh, being about meeting God in this book to an up close and personal relationship where he was in the details of my daily life and, and doing things and, and guiding me in ways that I never would have thought possible. And that, that was huge. That, that did happen. That was part of my experience, too. And it was absolutely awesome. It's one of the many reasons why I will never go back. <laughs> yes. Yeah, thank you for that. I, uh, this morning when I was getting ready, the song, Let Us Be More Aware of Your Presence, was on the radio. And yeah. it really stuck out to me. And, and you've, you've talked about that. Now, I tried to pray about that this morning because it was... It was standing out that he he's yeah not just in the pages of the book but he's in our daily lives um yeah. but what stood out to me as i was reading luke 10 was um verse 21 uh, the section in verse 21 about where jesus praises god for using children instead of or infants or whatever instead of wise men um, for his word and it stood out to me because I was I was started noticing this at the very beginning of when we were reading Luke the kind of people that God uses in this book um, yeah. to do his will and so I went back and I looked chapter one he uses Zachariah and Elizabeth and Mary people we never would have heard of would not have heard of if it if he hadn't been using them chapter two Simeon Anna and then again Mary and Joseph and then in chapter three it's John who's this weird guy living in the wilderness, right, eating bugs. These are the people that God used um, to get his will done, not kings and priests and prophets and Pharisees and scribes. And he, he didn't use those people. He used these people who were listening. Um, and and I, I, when, this, when I saw this uh, this week, I didn't think it tied to what you were talking about today but now all of a sudden it's tying and with what donald said and with what james said it, it, it's 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 really blending together and i appreciate that so. yeah well thank you uh yeah i i almost decided to preach on that verse but later changed to the, the story at the end but that is a an amazing thought and uh just shows the the wisdom of god 
and how, how differently he thinks than we do. <laughs> Somebody else? Anybody? All right. Well, appreciate the thoughts this morning. Great discussion. This morning, my heart is full seeing all so many new faces this morning. Not new faces, but the return of old faces. And, you know, it's, it feels good to be here and to see everyone. Um, just a couple things. We have a thank you note from the uh, Kernia family. Uh, her mother passed away a week ago, or so, maybe two weeks, um, and uh, she sent a thank you note. Uh, the Deavers were going to be on vacation, so they will not be here uh, next Sunday. They'll be leaving Wednesday, and they'll be back the following Sunday. Um, in Todd's uh, absence, Chuck has agreed to bring us our sermon that morning, so we're thankful that Chuck's here, and we're thankful that he's willing to, to step up and, and, and uh, pin shit for Todd. So. Uh, we are truly blessed by him being here. Um, one other announcement, the ladies' Bible class will begin on April the 16th. And if you are planning to be part of that, you need to let Janelle know uh, so that uh, she can order enough books. And uh, I think that was a great study. I know my wife was part of it, uh, the last study, and I know that she talked about it all the time. So, um, so it sounds like they have a good time together and they have a great class. So if you want to be part of that, catch up with Janelle so she can order books. Let's bow. Father, thank you for this morning and for 
the sunshine and for the warmer weather. And we're just grateful for all the blessings you give us. But mostly, Father, we're grateful for your son who died for us. We're grateful that because he did, we have a hope of eternal life. And Father, we pray that now as we go about our weeks that you'll, you'll stay near to us and that you'll protect us and that you'll walk with us. And Father, that you'll protect us from all the evil that is around us. Father, forgive us of any sins that we've committed, Father. We pray that uh, you'll bless our day. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.